right. Okay, we are starting. Uh, we're going to look at a passage in Luke. Luke 10, 38. If you could turn to Luke 10, 38, or it will be on the screen, Luke 10, 38. It's a familiar passage. It's a part of our lectionary passage. I would like to talk more if you tune in on um, Tuesdays. We'll talk about more what the lectionary is. You can follow along every week about whatever Pastor Mike or myself, we usually pick from a lectionary passage. So you could already be reading in the lectionary passages. But I'm looking at Luke 10, 38. Are y'all there? I'm reading from the NRSV. And it reads... Now, as they went on their way, he entered, this is Jesus, a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha, somebody say, but Martha, Martha. was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Few things are needed. Indeed, only one Mary has chose the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Amen. May God bless God's holy word. Our topic today, I just want to sit a little bit on in this title. Um, the title is Sit Down Somewhere. Come on, sit down somewhere. Tell somebody, sit down somewhere. Yes, yes. Oh, but for our little ones, if we have some little ones here, we have coloring books. We have uh, some things in the back for you if y'all need. Sit down somewhere. If you grew up in a black household, this was a very familiar statement. Amen. Raise your hand if you heard this statement when you grew up. And sit down somewhere. When did you usually get this told to you? It was, sa- it was past steps. Sit down somewhere. Because what were you usually doing in this moment? You were too much. You was extra. You was all over the place. And it always ended up you heard something from somewhere, from some authority figure telling you to sit down somewhere. Sit yourself. Be be still. Go, Go sit down somewhere. Well, for years I've heard this particular passage preached for years. And um, usually um, it always is preached in a context where, where we are uh, pitted Martha and Mary against each other. Have you all kind of experienced that? Like at worship conferences or things like that, it's always like, you know, um, stop being Martha. Be more like Mary. Like stop doing all, stop being so task oriented. Like sit down, be like Mary, worship at Jesus' feet. Anybody remember these kind of things? It's like, you know, Martha bad, Mary good. Like be more like Mary. And then, you know, all the Martha in you is like, oh, but I'm trying. I got so many things to do. And you usually leave feeling a little more burdened. Like how in the world am I going to be Mary? Because I got a lot of Martha in me. It's kind of like it was a, a, a choose. You had to choose Team Martha or Team Mary. It was a thing that you was usually told to us. But today, I would like for us to investigate this passage from a little different point of view. Y'all ready to walk with me? See, I'm really not mad at Martha. Can I tell y'all a secret? I'm not mad at Martha. Has anybody ever uh, worked in event planning before? Have you ever had an event planning job? Have you ever worked under someone who's an event planner? Have you ever been in charge of an event? It get real, right? You got details, you got situations, people not coming through. It's a whole thing. Have you ever been event planning? God bless you to all of those who are doing it for a living. It's a whole thing. It was a big deal to have Jesus over for dinner. Can you imagine Jesus coming through your village? You go, okay, bet, coming over. And I'm sure her and Mary had a plan. 
I'm sure they had a plan like, okay, good. Okay, he coming over. I'll handle the hummus. You gonna handle the lamb. You feel me? I'll do the pita bread. Okay, you got that? You chop up the salad. I'm gonna be in charge of the drink. Like, okay, we got it planned. Break. It's like, it's, it's 12, 13 hungry men are coming to our house. It's game time. Game time, Mary, we ready? Ready. Let's go. You got your task, you got your, we did, it's fair, equal, equal, let's go. And can you imagine as she's cooking the whole time? I'm sure they had a plan, she's very detailed. She's like, all right, it probably started off real cute, like, all right, this bread needs to go in the oven. You know how you start just saying things out loud, hoping people catch up to you, yep, yep. Um, the salad ain't gonna chop itself. I don't know what, uh, hey Jesus, how you doing? Hi, hi, hey, can I talk to you for a minute in the kitchen, Mary? Mary, let me holler at you in the kitchen. But Mary's just enthralled. She's just can't be bothered, right? Can you imagine the angst that Martha feel, felt? You know, like she's working, and in her mind, she's working hard, but Mary, Mary out there chilling. I'm not, I'm not entirely mad at her. Her reaction, what was her reaction? Um, I bet her reaction is a lot like our reactions. She said two things, two things. First thing she said, Lord, do you not care? Do you not care that my sister has left me to do the, all the work by myself? Come on, this is what she said to Jesus. And this is not the first time we've heard this phraseology. Who else said, Lord, do you care? The Bible trivia. Anybody else remember a situation and a group of people is like, don't, Lord, don't you care? Anybody remember? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Lazarus. And then who, I thought I heard another one. They was on a what? A boat. Y'all remember when all the waves and they was, and Jesus was doing what? Sleep, chilling. The first thing they said to him was, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? So we've heard this before, people questioning the integrity of the Lord. I mean, how frustrating, isn't it frustrating when Jesus doesn't cooperate with your plans? I mean, like, isn't that so frustrating? Like, come on, Jesus, do you see what's happening here? Martha went from welcoming Jesus into her home to blaming him for not caring. She questioned his integrity. She wanted Jesus to take sides. Anybody been there before? Jesus, clearly, clearly I'm right. I need you, you got a lightning bolt up there, something you could do to somebody. Like clearly, I'm the one in the right. I need you to handle them, talk to them, call something to happen for them to turn, you know. He, she wanted Jesus to take sides and I'm not, I can't really decipher who she was mad at more. Was she more mad at Jesus or was she more mad at Mary? She questioned this man, and we do the same thing. Amen. I don't want us to turn into a bashing Martha moment. God, where are you? Do you not care that this bill is due? Do you not care about this relationship? God, do you not care? We find ourselves in the Martha category. Second thing she said to Jesus was, this is the one. I was like, Martha, Martha might have been black. She might have been because she said, tell her to help me. Oop. Oop. Not Martha telling Jesus what to do. G Jesus, tell her. She gave Jesus orders. How you going to order? She, Jesus probably was like, um, if, if, you know, probably was looking around like, who is she talking to? Because... Mary, in her mind, she's like, clearly Mary's not listening to me. I gave her so many opportunities and hints to meet me in the kitchen. She's not, she not, she not listening to me, so can you tell her? But we do the same thing. We invite Jesus into our lives, and then we tell him what to do. Come on, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Take over. You can have all of me. But God, I'm going to need you to do A, B, C. Here's my list. I got it all set up. Come on, Jesus. Do you not care? I am Martha. Martha is me. Jesus' reply. I love Jesus' reply. 
Because like I said earlier, I would have been looking in bags and around pillows. But I'm trying to figure out who you talking to. But Jesus' reply was way different than what I would have did. Jesus says, and this is in the message version. Um, I, I love the reply they said in the message version, verse 41 and 42. Jesus replied, the master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course. It won't be taken from her. I love that. You know you had to call her name twice. You know she had to be doing the most if you had to call her name twice. Like, hey, Mar Mar Martha, Mark. He had to call her twice. See, in this passage, I don't think Jesus is necessarily condemning her actions. Jesus wasn't saying stop cooking. Jesus said, like, you over here doing too much, you're cooking, and you're, doing, you're making too much lamb, and you're making too much, like, stop cooking, Martha. It wasn't a bad thing what she was doing. She wasn't doing anything bad. It was the worry and distracted part. Y'all taking notes? It's the worry and distraction. Other translations said she was bothered, upset, anxious, and troubled. See, that part. It wasn't the, the thing she was doing. It wasn't, see, we get caught when we preach this, we talk about the task. When talking about the task, she interjected unnecessary anxiety to the visit. She had to be on 10. She was on 10 at this point. She was doing a lot. She was doing a lot to the point they was like, hey, Martha, 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 Martha. Come on. Rain, take a deep breath and breathe, right? And, and she was going, looks like she was going back and forth with all the preparations instead of sitting still. She was coming in, going out, coming in, worry, anxious, doing this, doing that, calling out people. See, Jesus questioned her, not because of her activity, but because of her attitude about it. Come on, let's sit in that for a minute. Wasn't the activity. It was the attitude. So I got a question for us. Because this hit me just as hard. How do you treat people when things don't go your way? Or when things don't go as planned? Come on, this is, I think this is the real lesson here. How are we treating people? How flexible are you when plans change? Come on, speaking to my Enneagram ones, my type A's, where y'all at? Uh-huh, uh-huh. How are we when, when we've had things well planned out, well mapped out, spreadsheets? Something goes wrong. Does the end always justify the means? If you pull off a great project, if you meet a deadline, you pull out of a great event, and you know, but you're doing a great thing all the time that you're working, you're working hard, but you're horrible to everyone in the process. Does the end justify the means? How were you treating people along the way? This is where I think Jesus was hitting at at this moment. I think we could go deeper into this scripture because I wonder deep down what was Martha's motive? Why was she on 10? Why was she doing the most? Because you know, in that culture, in that culture, the, um, the ancient uh, Palestine culture, hospitality and childbearing would have been the things that were a measure of a woman's worth, right? This might have gave her a sense of identity. Martha was trying to be hospitable, and it showed her worth, especially to Jesus. Like, this is the ultimate party. Jesus is here? Like, I, I got to be the talk of the Galilean news, right? However, Jesus wanted her to trust in him for her identity and value. So I have a news flash for you. This might mess up somebody's theology, so put your seatbelt on. There is absolutely nothing you can do to impress Jesus. 
Are you, I hope that didn't mess you, you, you all right? There's nothing you can do to impress Jesus. Now that doesn't mean we don't try to be in excellence, but I just want you to know that there's nothing you could do to make Jesus love you more or love you less. There's, there's nothing. You're, you're, how God's created you and fashioned you just as you are, Jesus loves you perfectly. There's nothing you can do to impress. Now I'm going to do all the things, and he's going to be so proud of me. Okay, that's cool. I mean, yeah, do the things. He wants to equip you and empower us to do things to make an impact on people, not necessarily make ourselves look good. Do we forget that sometime? It's not for us. It's for para todos. Um, so what, let's sit in this for a minute. The very reason Jesus had come to visit her that day was to spend time with her. But she ended up missing. She missed the whole point of that. So I, this, is my, this is my theory. This is my thesis I'm putting out. Um, this story is less about task, but more about posture. So we have on the opposite end, we have Mary, who chose to sit at his feet. Mary, the one that we usually be like, oh, I want to be more like Mary. It just feels like we can't never get there, right? Mary sat at his feet. Now, look, to sit at someone's feet, it was more than just like, oh, she did a cool thing, crisscross applesauce, and it was, like, cute. No, 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 no. To sit at someone's feet was a technical expression used in ancient times to indicate the intimate relationship between a disciple and a rabbi. To make someone your rabbi, to see somebody, a great teacher, and be like, hey, I'm following you, you my rabbi, was to fundamentally make a choice to be with him in order to learn everything you could about him. All right? Every activity in life became an opportunity to learn from the rabbi and how to be like the, the rabbi. So every time you're like, hey, you my dude, you my, like, it's like, you're my pastor, you're my teacher, you're my right, I'm doing everything with you. I'm, everything you do, I'm doing every, every moment is an opportunity to listen. And we see this from an example from Paul in Acts 22 and 3, write that down for cross-reference. Um, Paul sat under one of the greatest rabbis of his time, Gamaliel, and he, he put that on his resume, like, just in case y'all don't know who I am. I sat under Gamaliel. So it was a big thing to sit under someone. It was a part of their culture. So what you really don't catch in this passage, y'all got to catch, what you really don't catch is how revolutionary it was for Mary to be sitting at Jesus' feet. In Judaism, women could receive instruction from the Torah. However, it was unheard of. For a rabbi to allow a woman to sit at his feet. Sitting here at his feet demonstrated she wanted to learn from Jesus. Come on, catch this. It's deeper than what we read over. Prior to this, guess how many rabbis in all recorded history had a female disciple? Guess how many? I'll help you out. Zero. No other women had ever been recorded to have sat under a rabbi. No respectable rabbi would have ever let a woman be in his intimate circle. Yet Jesus allowed it. Not only did he allow it, he encouraged it. Come on, think about this. Come on, all the women should be happy in this house right now. Come on. So are we really taking time? to be discipled by Jesus. This is what the moment was about. Not just coming to church, not just logging on, we're glad that you're doing all those things. But I'm talking about personally being discipled by Jesus. This is where that personal relationship comes in. Because we need both in, right? We need community and we need our own personal time with Jesus. Mary sat at the Lord's feet. Now this just isn't just a description of her location in the room. It had to do with the posture of her heart. Come on, this is, this is, this is where we're going we to sit in this for a minute. Learning to be present with Jesus. Come on, say that. Somebody say, I'm learning to be present with Jesus. Now, I know it's hard to do with Jesus because we can't even be present with each other. Go to any restaurant, what you going to see? See people on dates? They on their phone. 
You see, people at some we it's hard to be present. Uh, some of us know what it is to live without phones. Y'all remember that? How did we live? We just had a happy time. We was just living. See, we just we waited in waiting rooms. We read magazines. What did we do before this? We talk. Oh, we talk to people. Oh, wow. So if we can't even be present with each other, I know it's a challenge to be present with Jesus. To be still. Sit down somewhere. <laughs> Taking time to be and not just to do. You know, we're called human beings, not human doings. Just being. Just taking time just to be. Undistracted time with Jesus. Lord, please help me. Because every time I'm like, I'm going to pray. It's going to be great. And then I end up on Instagram somehow. I don't know what happens. <laughs> just scrolling, laughing. Like, what happened? Lord, Jesus, put the phone down. Undistracted. I'm not thinking about nothing else. Not thinking about a bill. Not thinking about a project. Not thinking about an email. Undistracted time with Jesus. What if Martha would have said, okay, look, Jesus, I had this plan. Clearly, I had a plan. It, um, it's all for you. I'm doing this all. The dinner's for you. Um, but what's on your agenda? What, 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 what do you want to do? I mean, it's your dinner. It's in your honor. What do you want to do right now? It feels like you're inviting me to be present with you. It feels like you're inviting me to be in the moment. Could you, you think she had enough faith to let it go? Just let the dinner go, let her identity go, let the works go, let the striving go, let her reputation go, and just spend some time with Jesus? Maybe, y'all, maybe, just maybe, this whole thing was a lesson in capitalizing on a moment. Capitalizing on a moment that you may never get back. Maybe this was what this moment was about. Because remember, Jesus was here in the flesh. He had a short trajectory, three years of ministry. He could already see, I'm on my way to the cross. This has never been done to I've never. Women have never been invited to sit at a rabbi's feet. This is a moment. It's a moment that you might not get back. I'm not going to always be here. You're going to have the Holy Spirit to come, but I won't be here physically. It's a moment. How many moments do we miss being worried? distracted, overly obsessed with details, mad because it didn't go the way we planned it out. How many moments are, maybe the Lord is inviting us into moments to capitalize on moments. I know y'all, I was not here last week and I was, boy, I wish I was in the building with y'all. So I got a taste of, once again, since the pandemic of being online and worshiping and I had to do everything. I stop doing the dishes. Stop doing chores. You didn't need you did not need to fix a bowl of cereal right now. Like doing all the things. Being distracted. How about when it's time to worship, whenever you get to watch this program, taking time to be present. Not doing anything else. Spending time with Jesus. Maybe this is what Jesus was doing in her heart, sit down somewhere. How many opportunities do we miss? The one thing Martha needed was to cease all her activities and sit at Jesus' feet and hear his words. That was the better part. The most important thing is to be in relationship with Jesus and to hear from him. Do y'all, do, did everyone hear? That's the most important thing. Not the doing of the activities. That is an outworking of being with him and being present in here. Is our prayer life more like Martha or Mary? I know I'm hitting, no, I'm hitting, I'm hitting this up. This hit me first, so y'all going to get it too. Are we more like Martha or Mary in our prayer life? Is your prayer life more about a list of complaints which is good. Bring your burdens to the Lord. Yes, cast it on him. But is it more of a monologue or a dialogue? Is it all us speaking? Is it all me speaking? Is it all you speaking? Or are you taking time to hear what God wants to say back to you? Through the word, through your spirit. Do we set time to sit? Not, not me. I'm like, here's my plan, my agenda. I'm giving it to you. Is that cool? 
Okay, bet. Now you go. Like, never taking time just to really sit and hear and listen. Jesus said what Mary chose would not be taken from her. It will remain with her. So to Jesus' disciples, who was us, Jesus says, sit at my feet. Devour my teachings. There's no important meal. There's no more important meal. She chose the main course. Because you know what that food she was making, Martha? That food, you'll eat it, and what is going to happen? It's going to digest it, and then you're going to be hungry again in a couple of hours or the next day. You ever have a real good meal? I mean, good. And you got the nerve to wake up the next day hungry. I was like, what? That, that should have lasted me a lifetime. No. Things are temporary. Just like in our lives, things are temporary. That, that's just transitional, right? Just like the things that we want so much, that we desire so much, the jobs that we want, transitional. The relationships that we want. There are some relationships in my life you couldn't have gave me enough. I would have bet every dollar I had that I would still be in those relationships. Gone. Gone. Transactional. What about um, money? Money come and gone. How many had some money before and that money gone? Comes and goes. All these things are transactional. But Jesus said, I am the living bread. Hallelujah. The living bread. Do you know what that means? Jesus said that. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Come on, this is what Jesus, this is what happens when we sit at the feet of Jesus. This is what happens. You get that thing that lasts. That satisfies. That'll never go away. That's not transactional. That's not commutable. It's here today and gone tomorrow. This is what happens. This is what Mary was doing. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you see what she was doing? That's why she's like, yeah, yeah, miss me with that food. What I'm getting right now? I can't, I can't get from nowhere else. Has anybody tasted? The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you ever felt that thing that God can only satisfy, that void in your heart and your soul that only God can feel? You can look a thousand years for it, but you never find it anywhere else. But the one who really provides nourishment, sustenance, it only comes from God. Amen. At the end of the day, you only need one thing. Somebody say one thing. You only need one thing. All the strategy you need is at his feet. All the wisdom, all the direction, all the identity, all the love you need, find it at his feet. It's only one thing needful. Everything else will pass away. So service to God starts, like we said, at his feet, and works outward, right? Not vice versa. So being at Jesus' feet, and we're closing on this, represents the acts of worship, giving him the same honor reserved for God. It is an open acknowledgement that a person who recognizes who Jesus is, that there's something special about Jesus, that when I'm resting, God is working. Amen? Anybody believe that? When I'm being still, God's filling me up. That is where we get our strength and our power. Amen, amen. Um, we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. But we have a God who wants to be with us. Isn't that amazing? Wants to spend time with you. Wants you to be your authentic self. You know, you can't always be your real self with people. Sometimes, like, you I might be too much for some people. You got to dial it back or turn it on. You know, you could be your real person, your real self with Jesus. So go ahead. Let's just go ahead and stand. We're just going to um, just have a time of reflection. When you find yourself, the next time you find yourself worried, distracted, questioning God, mad because he won't take sides with you, blaming others, it's time to go sit down somewhere. 
and make your way to the feet of Jesus. Here's our reflection questions for today. Do you find it difficult to sit still as you get out the way? Draw on the word of God and rest in his presence. Or are you distracted by the cares of this world or serving? Have you managed to find the correct balance yet? And if not, how will you achieve this? These are things you could just reflect on this week. Again, we're not, we need both in the kingdom, right? We need Martha's and Mary's. It wasn't about the activity. It was about the attitude. How are we treating people? What's your opinion of God in the, in the meantime? Do you believe that God cares for you even when things aren't going your way? So as we are rebuilding our community, right, let's not just rush right back into serve mode. You know, we need greeters, we need hostess, we need kids ministry, we need, we need all those things, yes. But our first thing, the one thing we need is as a community to be in the feet of Jesus, to be in the worship, to become disciples, to know God for ourselves, not just for ourselves and be like, oh, I don't need church because I know God for myself. No, to be in community, it's a both end. That's why we have Tuesday night prayer. That's why we have Bible study, to go deeper into the word of God. Sunday mornings is great, but it's just like, eat an ice cream on Sunday. That should be the, the cherry on top of everything that we've been doing in our own personal work. Amen. We have worship night coming up. When you're watching online, be intentional. Engage into our services. This is how we will not be so distracted. Amen. We won't have so much worry. We'll just be like Mary and be enthralled and captivated at the feet of Jesus and getting everything we need. So let's just have a time of prayer. Just begin to think about the things that God is showing you through this sermon. And I want to just make space for those who are hearing about Jesus for the first time. You're like, this is the kind of God I want to serve. I don't really know Jesus like that. This is your opportunity to know Jesus for yourself. If that's you and you're watching or you're here, you're like, I really want Jesus in my life. Can you just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you are Lord, that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I want to become a follower of you. Make me a disciple, and I'll follow you all the days of my life. For the rest of us who are here, let's just have a time of reflection as we're just worshiping. Just do some business with God. So God, we give you this time. God, this is our heart. God, we want to serve you. We want to do good for you. We want to represent you. We want to make you proud. But at the same time, God, give us balance. Let us find everything we need at your feet. Let us be intentional with our relationship with you. And Lord, let us see something amazing happen. Let the, melt, let the cares and the worries and the way we treat people, God, let it improve this week. God, we love you so much. Let us be captivated by your conversation. Speak to us so clearly as we endeavor to hear from you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen, and thank God. Come on, if you received the word on today, would you just begin to give the Lord a hand praise? Tell the person next to you, sit down somewhere. <laughs>